In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why does the church recognize the nativity of John the Baptist? It's a good question. The only other birth that we celebrate is Jesus's. We don't recognize the birth of any of the apostles. We don't even have a feast day for the nativity of Mary, the mother of our Lord. But John, the locust-eating, camel-hair-wearing, fiery-eyed preacher of the desert, he does get his birth celebrated by the church on earth. So why this man out of all the others? When it came to John the baptizer, Jesus had this to say, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Jesus places a great deal of importance on John. No one is greater than him. Of anyone who's been born of women. That's quite the endorsement from the Son of God. John is the Elijah who is to come. The one who is prophesied in the very last verses of the Old Testament who would come just before the day of the Lord when the Lord himself would arrive on the earth. John is the voice of one crying, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And so his voice rang through the desert wilderness surrounding the muddy Jordan. His clear voice cut through the mealy-mouthed mumbling and self-righteous grumbling of the desert-hearted Pharisees and scribes. His voice was the crystal clear toll of truth in the desert of the world at his time. And indeed, through his words recorded in Holy Scripture, John still cries out in the desert of our own world, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. In our dusty, thirsty world of half-truths and constant capitulation, in our wilderness of self-righteousness and bland complacency, John's is a voice that stirs our hearts to action, that awakens us from the soft, hypnotic slumber of our indifference. So John is, or at least should be, important to us. And that's why we celebrate his birth, his nativity. He is important. No, more than that. He is the greatest of those born to women, except for our Lord himself. He ranks only after Jesus in his birth, in his preaching, in his life, and in his death. And it's in that connection to Jesus, his birth, his life, his preaching, his death, that we come to learn the crucial importance of John the baptizer. John is important because when we get John, we get Jesus. Jesus comes with John, born only six short months after John was born. John is in Jesus' family, his cousin to be precise, And so the two come as a package deal. When John is there, when John's words are with us, you can be sure that Jesus isn't far behind. John speaks, and he's answered by Jesus. John says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus replies, yes, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is me. John says, comfort, comfort my people. And Jesus says, yes, your comfort has arrived. Find your rest in me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John sings, your warfare is over, your iniquity pardoned, and you have received from your Lord's hand double for all your sins. 
And Jesus answers by opening that hand and saying, Take, eat. This is my body given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. These two cousins, heralds and preachers of the good news of salvation, are in a duet. They sing in glorious harmony about the redemption and comfort of our God. In the song of these messengers, the entire will of God is laid out. Law and gospel, repentance and grace, trembling and comfort, fear and consolation, death and life, anticipation and fulfillment. One sings and the other harmonizes. One line of melody is expanded by the other. These two sing in a holy round about the gracious work of our God as he saves sinners. John begins and Jesus repeats the round, elaborating and expanding it, a close and beautiful variation on the theme that was begun with Moses and the prophets. As an example, see how this duet works in our window. John preached a baptism of repentance. All Judea and Jerusalem went out and confessed their sins to him, speaking them aloud so that their sins could be pulled out of them and drowned in the Jordan River. Now Jesus took this baptism of John and transfigured it going beneath the waves himself, absorbing all of those drowned sins and then bestowing his purity. He fulfilled all righteousness that had begun with John and the prophets, completing it, filling out the song, bringing it to its glorious crescendo. He fills in the gaps. He sings the missing notes. He completed the song. Jesus was the hope of Isaiah the hope of Moses, and the hope of John the Baptist. And this is why John's entire life and preaching pointed to Jesus. John's life and death prefigured his Lord's. So today we celebrate his unusual birth, born to a barren couple that was far too old to be having children, His birth opening the lips of his father, Zechariah, restoring the old priest's voice so that he could sing praise and blessings upon God and those who would hear the words of his son. We celebrate John's unusual birth because it points us to Jesus' own unusual nativity, to be born of a virgin, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. Today we recognize and celebrate John the Baptist's life and preaching because it focuses our eyes and ears on our Lord's life and preaching. John shows us what's really important. He cuts away all of those other things that we've concerned ourselves with, who's important in the world, the soft clothes and powerful halls of the world, the elite, the reeds blowing in the wind of popular opinion, the frenetic panic of our overly packed schedules. He shows that these are only distractions, vanity, mere mirages in the desert. And in the place of all this static, John renews the theme of the divine song so that we know what to listen for when our Messiah raises his voice. John teaches us how to listen, what's really important, where to focus. He prefigures what the cross-shaped life of Jesus will look like so that we can know that the long-awaited Savior has truly arrived, even if it is among crosses and trials and hardships, just as John the forerunner lived and just as we who follow in this same pattern will as well. John the baptizer followed Jesus, even though he was ahead of him, at least chronologically speaking. 
And he teaches others to do the same, no matter when or where we live. He teaches us the tune so that we can join in the heavenly round, repeating the words of our Savior, walking in his ways, chanting his melodies, forsaking the sins and vanities that cling so closely, receiving forgiveness and freedom from his cross. We celebrate John's birth because it prefigures our own unusual birth, our birth in the waters of baptism, a baptism and birth of repentance, turning away from the darkness and toward the light to the sunrise visiting us from on high. No matter when or where we live, we're taught to follow our Lord's life, death, and resurrection, just as John did, just as the apostles did, as the church fathers, as our parents and godparents and heroes in the faith have. We sing with John the Baptist, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, receiving again the knowledge of salvation in the forgiveness of our sins. In the name of Jesus, who shows us how to live and die and live again. Amen.